This is Defender Radio. Defender Radio is brought to you by the Association for the Protection of Fur-Bearing Animals. It's the week of June 19th, 2017, and this is Michael Howey welcoming you to episode 434 of Defender Radio. Wildlife corridors are becoming beautiful and iconic scientific feats that show our ability to coexist with animals when we put our minds to it. And the Trans-Canada Highway through Banff National Park is perhaps the best example of that. Twinning of the highway, or doubling its width, began in 1981, and with it, a bold plan to make it safer for animals to get across the busy highway. Currently, more than 40 corridors of multiple designs serve the animals, and the latest research is highlighting the incredible success of the program managed by Parks Canada. Wildlife collisions have reduced by more than 80%, and almost 90% for various ungulates, such as deer, moose, and bighorn sheep. The development of the structures, which have become postcard-esque examples of scientific coexistence, the engineering tasks associated with choosing locations, plant life, and style of crossing, and what it's like to look back at nearly 30 years of success were discussed with Terry McGuire, Parks Canada veteran and project coordinator for the new Trans-Canada Highway twinning in Yoho National Park. I'd like to go back to the early involvement you had with this, uh, and I think your, your first involvement was with the Banff twinning. Um I I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall in the room when you or someone suggested, hey, why don't we make a wildlife corridor and it'll only cost a couple million dollars? Right. Uh, based on my knowledge of government conversation, <laughs> that would have been entertaining. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so how, how did it all get started, I guess, is really sort of what I, I'm curious about. Well, I guess the genesis goes back to, gosh, the early 80s. And or even the late seventies, and the section of highway east of Banff all the way to the to the the Banff bound uh, east gate was a section of highway where there was a huge number of elk were being mowed down and killed on a regular basis as the traffic volumes were, were starting to increase, and so there was this great uh, discussion. We have to do something about this, uh, both from a motorist safety perspective as well as the impact it was having on the the, the ungulate population in, in Banff. And so I uh, came forward with this, okay, well, we have to four-lane the highway. Well, this was almost heresy at the time in terms of doing this within a national park. Why don't we just relocate the, the Trans-Canada Highway right out of the park and, and uh, solve the problem that way? And so there was there was a huge uh, public forum and debate that was part of a, a larger environmental assessment. And so at the end of the day, the conclusion was is that the, it, the, the highway couldn't be relocated. It was going to have to be upgraded to, to four lanes, but it needed to take into to account special precautions for, for addressing wildlife uh, mortality and especially the movement across the highway because certainly the, the easy solution is simply put a fence along both sides and that keeps the wildlife from getting into the highway. But that also acts as a, a fence or a, a barrier to, to connectivity for animals to get from one side of the road to the other to where their food or water is as well as as you start to isolate uh, populations and so as part of that project that our first phase we saw the in- installation of some relatively small underpass structures of you know either a three or four meter a diameter culvert or something in the range of a, a, a simple bridge span of uh, of about 14 uh, meters, but everything was was to go under the highway, and so it got built, probably completed in uh, the mid to, to late uh, 80s, and and that's certainly solved the problem from a wildlife uh, mortality perspective. But unfortunately, what happened was there was no follow through in terms of monitoring, in terms of the actual effectiveness and and use of these crossing structures. Like most projects, the capital money ran out and there wasn't an operating budget to to see that happen. And so 
what happened is then there was a period of time that uh, that elapsed, and that's when I came onto the project in the uh, the mid '90s to see uh, uh, the the twinning advance beyond Banff uh, all the way towards uh, uh, the Lake Louise and the, and the west boundary of the park, another some uh, 45 or 50 kilometers of distance. And so, again, we went through a bit of the uh, the gnashing of teeth and uh, and revisiting history in terms of whether uh, the solution was four-laning the highway. And then we got into the discussion, okay, well, could the public started asking, and rightfully so, how effective were these existing uh, crossing structures that were put in the early phases? And of course, the problem was is that we didn't have any information at all that were, where it actually had been monitored. And so we we're basing a lot of uh, decisions and answers on anecdotal information that we had. And uh, and so at the end of the day, there was a push and recognizing that in the mid-90s, we didn't have the internet and, and all of the electronic and the... Uh, provisions that we we currently have today and so what came forward was notions of we need uh, to make these bigger in Europe we're hearing about large overpass structures for addressing wildlife movement and and or we need larger crossing structures or underpasses because we don't think wildlife are using them and so erring on the side of caution is is more or less what we put together in, into a budget uh, uh, sufficient funds that we thought to to build larger crossing structures, and so uh, as uh, as the project got approved, then we we then were in a position to start looking at physically, and we were originally starting to think about just using underpasses, and uh, but a couple of the locations that have been identified where wildlife were were known to be using and crossing the highway. Uh, didn't really lend themselves to underpasses. They were they had high sides on both sides, and or there wasn't a valley or a dip in the, which would have cost huge amounts of money to them to have to raise the highway high enough to to then allow for an underpass, which then also led us to the to the idea of well, what about an overpass structure similar to what people are telling us about in Europe, and uh, without a budget to go and fly to Europe and everything else, we we kind of struck off on our own and. Uh, but lo and behold, when we started doing some of the engineering and looking at it, we, we came to the conclusion that by doing some precast concrete arches, that in fact, for the amount of money we had set aside for a, a 30 meter underpass structure, we could in fact, for that same price, build a 50 meter overpass structure. And so that led to the genesis of the kind of iconic, what I call the double arch overpass structures that uh, now are, there are six of them that cross the Trans-Canada Highway from east uh, west of Banff all the way to, to the Lake Louise. And so that's kind of a, you know, the, the, a bit of the history of it. And, and so certainly one of the lessons that we learned from the early phases was that we needed to monitor these things. And I think you talked to Derek Peterson and, uh, yesterday about the overall success of, uh, and, and as a result of that monitoring, which has been going on for a number of years, We've now learned a great deal about uh, uh, these crossing structures and what types of animals use them. And, of course, we've also then now become kind of uh, uh, the go-to people to ask uh, for, from other areas of the country and down in the States in terms of that are looking at building these crossing structures, what what we've learned. And, of course, uh, we're learning from them as well as uh, as the, the process evolves. Well, and if someone had come up to you and said, you know, 30 years ago, um, you're going to reduce mortality and collisions by 80% by building these structures. Uh, is that so, like is that something you could have believed or would that have been beyond expectation? Well, I think I would have believed that the reduce the, the mortality by 80 or more percent because it's really the fence that's doing that. It's not mm -hmm. the crossing structures. It's the fences and, you know, they're, they're two and a half meters high and we've learned that, you know, Wildlife being what they are, are, are crafty little devils, and 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 some of them were able to get under the fence. So we've we built in protection in terms of burying the fence into the ground so that animals can't dig underneath them. And we've monitored them, and we've looked at, you know, uh, putting a, a, a t high tensile strength wire along the top because what happens is the trees fall over, and then the 
breaks the the fence and wildlife can use the uh, the trees or whatever to to get into the into the right of way so from that perspective yeah i would have believed anywhere from 80 to to 90 percent effectiveness in terms of of reducing wildlife mortality in terms of the crossing part well that was always a, as you say the a bit of an unknown and and i might have been a little bit skeptical certainly i've got uh, cartoons where people sh- you know have, have showed me dragging wildlife across one of these crossing <laughs> structures because, you know, there's a lot of skepticism in terms of their success, yeah. and especially when you start talking about investing several million dollars on, on one crossing structure. But it, it didn't take long that uh, from our initial uh, monitoring that we started to see wildlife using them. Certainly some species adapted more quickly than others uh, uh, Deer and, and elk and whatnot seem to, to gravitate to the structures fairly easily, where the more wary species, carnivores, such as bears and whatnot, were, took a while to, to, to adapt to them. And, but yeah, I think at the end of the day, we've, we've certainly learned a lot of things, uh, and, uh, we've proven to, at the end of the day that, uh, in fact, they, they are a solution. Not for everybody, of course. You know that there it's, it's an expensive proposition to, and and I know that in some places they've tried putting in crossing structures without the fence, hoping that wildlife would gravitate to them, and then have subsequently had to come back and and put in fence to 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 direct wildlife to to these crossing points because otherwise uh, their natural tendency is to avoid them. Yeah, and you know I was driving. Um... And saw a really cool fencing structure, and it, was, it made me think of all of this uh, a while back. And there was, no, as far as I know, there were no overpasses or underpasses, but um, or corridors, I mm-hmm. should say. But there, there was fencing along the whole way, and it was designed so that animals could get off the side of the highway, right or that right of way, and back behind the right. fence. But getting over the fence would be exceptionally difficult. Right. Um, and to me, this is it's interesting yeah. that like you sort of. You think, okay, well, we're going to put up a fence, but then, and this is where you crazy engineers come into play and say, well, how's the animal going to get back across if they do get right. over? Yeah, well, and certainly those are some of the things that you know. As time has gone on, we've we've come to the you know, yeah, you expect a hundred percent exclusion of, but you know, just nature being what it is, that uh, some wildlife will find its way inside the, and so you know, in our first iterations of the the project, we had just simple man gates where a warden would have to go out and open the gate and then we'd try to uh, uh, herd the uh, the animal uh, out of the, r- the right-of-way and through this gate. And then we also came up with one-way gates when we were looking at specifically ungulates like elk and that, uh, where it had a set of tines that opened outward. So if they got inside the, uh, the right-of-way, they could exit out but couldn't come back through. Well, it didn't take long for a several clever elk there to figure out they could get their antlers within the tines and pull them back and and work their way in so it's, and then they'd bed down and of course w- within the right of way it's it's fairly uh, attractive because there's a lot of uh, lush growth in there and we got some of the smaller mammals like voles and and mice in there which then tend to to attract coyotes and so you know through that iterative process when we came up with these jump out ide- ideas where an animal inside the the fence can can jump out, but because uh, there's a it's a fairly vertical wall on the other side, they're, they're less uh, able to to then hop back through the other way. So it acts as a kind of a one way passage. Well, and uh, something I find interesting, and I was thinking about how to how to do, uh, phrase this, and the only way I could really think about it was my uh, glory days of playing Sim City. And building the highway, uh, and I know this is exactly how you guys do it with all of your, your training and education uh, as engineers. Um, and you, you stretch the highway across and then realize, and again, this is so realistic because it's SimCity. Um, and, you know, the highway doesn't function just because you put it there. Um, when you look at the, the corridors, they're not going to function just because. Uh, what goes into the process of deciding the ideal location of the type of crossing. Mm-hmm. Uh, how, how do you determine that? Well, certainly it's, it's kind of a, it's a team effort, you know, certainly from an engineering perspective, an engineer would go out there and say, well, this is the, the most economical spot because there happens to be a dip in the, in the landscape. But if wildlife aren't actually utilizing that particular area, then you could very well find yourself with a bit of a white elephant. And so, Part of it is then 
the ecologists and biologists go out and we do some advanced uh, either winter tracking to uh, to establish where wildlife is crossing also uh, do some uh, telemetry in terms of the number of animals uh, uh, collared to to see exactly where their their range and where their pattern of movement is plus just using some some uh, known understanding of of the the nature of the the, the the animals and you know most animals tend to, to use uh, uh, tributaries and along travel along uh, drainage corridors and that so you start looking at those kinds of of elements and then the biologists come with that uh, that particular perspective and the engineers look at it and say well the, you know to build something at this particular location if it's an underpass then we've got these kinds of considerations and an overpass if we've got uh, landscape and terrain that that lends to it so it's a bit of a back and forth between uh, you know to find ultimately uh, uh, the the best location and from a parks canada perspective what we've done is is kind of again because our mandate is one of ecological integrity and the, the long-term survival of uh, of the uh, the parks and all the animals within it is to to err on the side of caution and so we've we've developed what we call a kind of a a scale of uh, of underpass or overpass crossing structures and so we'll identify for sure we know where major wildlife movement corridors are where wildlife is moving and and that's where we'll identify what we call a primary crossing structure so these are these are the major investment these are the big overpass structures that are up to 50 meters in in width uh, in terms of underpass or overpass that uh, we know that the majority of wildlife will utilize, and then we've we've got what we call secondary crossing structures, which are a little bit smaller. They're more kind of 20 meters in in width, and usually an underpass structure where we identify this is also a likely location where wildlife will will want to cross the highway, but may not be to the same extent and and usage as these primary crossings, and then. To fill in the gaps between these ones is what we call our tertiary crossing structures, which go in about every meter or kilometer and a half to two kilometers and are usually smaller four by seven uh, box or elliptical culverts that uh, will allow for, for wildlife movement that the odd animal that bumps up against the fence that way you want to cross the highway doesn't have to travel four or five kilometers down the the outside of the, the fence to find a crossing point, but will will happen on these on uh, on a regular basis. And so, from that perspective, then and then a, the other aspect is that a lot of the structures they're all varying in, in difference. There's overpass structures. There's these underpass structures because what monitoring has told us is that when you're trying to to deal with all varieties of and of species of animals that some have preferences for darker, more confined crossing structures uh, like an underpass uh, uh, where cougar and and black bear seem to have gravitated to those where the overpasses are are seem to to be favored by grizzlies and uh, and and wolves so that you know we give the whole buffet so to speak to to wildlife to choose how how they get across the the highway and and from that you know we've we've certainly seen that uh, uh, it's been successful in terms of uh, every type of uh, animal from monitoring has, has been shown to cross the highway as, as well as whether they be female or male. It's just a matter of some adapt to them more quickly than others. In talking with Eric and in, in my experience in, in covering uh, ecological and environmental planning issues. Connectivity is a very big issue, and you've you've already uh, said the word several times. And that's you know the way I learned about it. Uh, covering news in sort of suburban Toronto was how municipalities would require developers to set aside certain amounts of land for green space. So a developer would create a wood lot, mm-hmm. and it's all very well and nice. And then thirty years later, we're all trying to figure out why that wood lot is dying. Um, because there's, you know, you look at it and it has everything it should have. And what the, uh, the researchers have found is simply that it's not connected to anything. Right. Uh, there is, there's no f- physical connectivity between it and other parts of the ecosystem, all of which need to come together. Um, when we're talking about these corridors, how do you incorporate, and this, this is sort of a, it, it, it's almost a uh, philosophical question, I think. How do you incorporate that sort of ecological aspect into the hard math of engineering to um, 
not only provide a pathway for wildlife, but to then very much connect different parts of an ecosystem together, mm-hmm. um, sort of bringing together that the cement of the highway and the grass of the meadow. How, how does that happen? Well, and, and it, it's a very difficult uh, question to, to answer because it all depends on your circumstances. In the case of Parks Canada, of course, we're the land manager, and, and the, because the highway happens to run through a national park, then the responsibility for its recapitalization and maintenance and whatnot falls to Parks Canada. And so we own both the lands outside of the, the formal highway corridor on both sides, and, and therefore one of the, con- the aspects of choosing a location for crossings and whatnot doesn't really factor in from a Parks Canada perspective because we know we own the, the woodlot on both sides and so that, that connection can happen. In the outside of a national park and a mandate for ecological integrity, then you get into the situation, and this is where we often get into to long conversations with colleagues uh, that are working in the uh, for uh, provincial or or state uh, de- departments of transportation, because their their mandate is purely looking within the corridor itself, and and less concern outside in terms of the woodlots on either side. And so, certainly, when we go back to uh, one of the considerations for choosing a, a crossing opportunity is you really have to look at there's one thing to put the crossing in but then the next challenge is to ensure that the 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 lands on both sides that are being connected are somehow maintained in into uh, perpetuity in terms of of their establishment because otherwise what you'll get is is as you say these islands of uh, of uh, of um, uh, habitation but with no new gene pool coming in, then those particular uh, little islands w- will eventually die out. So it's a major factor in, in thinking about when you are going to put in a crossing structure that, in fact, there are places to, to link to. And then you can go to a larger scale, you know, uh, continent-wide, and that's where you get into the organizations like uh, Y2Y, uh, Yukon to, the, to Yellowstone, that are looking at, Okay, you, what we have is a national park like, like Banff, even though it's very large in, in, in size, it's essentially a woodlot in, in terms of the larger, uh, uh, continent. And so then that's where we're, you know, their real interest is trying to, to ensure that connectivity from, from a wood, uh, from a, a Banff National Park down to a Glacier National Park in the U.S. and the Yellowstone, and and to ensure that those corridors, are, that at least, there's a way for wildlife to get across some of these major highway corridors, and that's uh, that's a that's a significant challenge in today's uh, environment in terms of development and the extent of uh, lands being taken up. Yeah, and that's I actually saw a, a very interesting hypothesis a while ago, and I have no idea where it was anymore. Um, but it was stating that in order to have true ecological, I guess, security in the long term for North America, we need to start developing land along our longitudes, mm-hmm. so along the meridians that go north to south, because that's where the greatest gaps are. Um, so while a lot of our stuff, and I think, you know, maybe even the Trans Canada Highway is kind of a neat example of this, it, it goes east to west primarily. Um, whereas a lot of the land needs to run north to south, but it, for some reason doesn't, um, it was just one of those interesting kind of, you look at the map and you go, huh? Well, and certainly we've seen, you know, there's, there's low, you know, and you'll always get uh, local, um, populations of, of animals that live within a, a certain set uh, geographic uh, spatial area, but then you also have these interlopers or long range that have huge uh, habitats where the, that they travel within that you can see this north-south kind of movement that they, they want to undertake uh, as, they, as they disperse uh, uh, great distances. And so, you know, and so that's one of the things that, you know, we're, we're also aware of and try to, to accommodate uh, with our crossing opportunities is that recognize that there will be local uh, populations of animals that become used to these structures, but there will also be these far-ranging uh, interlopers that come in that, uh, but are important to certainly genetics uh, from, a, from a variance perspective and uh, gene pool to add to so that you don't get uh, kind of population interbreeding amongst themselves. And so one of the big areas, of course, is right now is uh, 
now that we've completed and you know after you know as pop as transportation and traffic volumes increased and mortality increased along the sections we we can now successfully say that you know since that early 80s that now as of 2010 2011 we were able to to four lane the, the and twin the trans canada all the way through banff national park but yoho national park abuts Banff, and so there's another 45 kilometers of trans canada highway that that proceeds further west as as we move into bc and so we're just uh, in the process now of starting that that particular section of work and uh, the government in 2016 announced just under $86 million to, to advance four-laning. And so we're currently building a six-kilometer stretch of, uh, of highway uh, tying into where the, the twinning left off in Banff. And, and moving further west, that will see us crossing the Continental Divide, which uh, is also a major wildlife corridor because uh, this is where we, we see a lot of wildlife movement. And so for the in that particular six kilometer stretch, we'll see probably four major crossing opportunities provided for, for wildlife. There'll be, uh, there's a large 20 meter underpass structure, a couple of these tertiary four by seven uh, underpass uh, structures. Plus we'll be building for the first time uh, an arch uh, overpass structure that spans the full four lanes in Banff, uh, we referenced before the kind of the, the double arch uh, uh, section where because the highway was split uh, in the middle there, there was a divided uh, grass median. We were able to, to, put, to put the abutments in the middle uh, uh, between the two lanes, which allowed for these, these two arches. Now, through the, 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 the section that we're currently building in Yoho, because of tight constraints, we have a mountain on one side and the CP rail right away on the other side. The highway essentially is just being widened uh, to, the, to the left and right of its center line. So that means that there's no no place in the middle to to actually set a to bring these arches down, and so we're now building a a 33 meter spanned arch that will go across all four lanes of the highway plus the shoulder and a, and a couple of uh, acceleration deceleration lanes. So it's, it's it's going to be a fairly massive structure in terms of, and certainly one of the first in North America to to span that kind of a distance with an arch. Well, and I'm playing with Lego. I am quite confident that that would be very difficult to do. Um, uh, I feel like our, our experiences with building things are very different, you and I. Um, <laughs> mine seem to be focused around toys and games. But... Yeah, my, my, my Lego sets are a little bit bigger. <laughs> <laughs> Those well, big and... Lego uh, concrete blocks. <laughs> <laughs> Probably hurt a whole lot more if you step on one of those in the middle of the night, too. Exactly. They, they, they do tend to step on you, though, Ooh, <laughs> more yeah. than you step on them. Uh, well, and that's actually, uh, to me, very interesting. And this is, again, you know, I think coming because I come from both the side uh, of journalism and from the side of advocacy for wildlife, I have a bit of a slant towards how the government views wildlife. So expanding these highways makes sense from that political point of view. I mean, it, it improves transportation, it's going to increase capacity, and infrastructure spending is always an economic stimulus. Um, mm-hmm. But then you're, you're sort of, your team is saying, and we need to increase that budget by X amount so we can help the bear across the road. Right. When we talk about sort of that, you know, from the 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 obvious benefits of that for the animals and for some people, how... And I, I guess what makes it really fascinating too is the fact that this is like it, it's all, almost multi generational through governments. Mm-hmm. Um, has have governments been typically supportive? And I'm not referencing individual parties. I'm not going to put you in that position, right. but yeah. just sort of the overall management of Parks Canada has it always been something that they're supportive of, or is it something that you kind of had to really push for at first? Well, I think we had to to push for it at first, you know, because highways were always seen as kind of this adjunct to to the parks canada mandate of of uh, its overall uh, mandate to ensure ecological integrity for future generations but it also then started to dawn on people these highways themselves were were major uh inf- impacts and influencers on that ability to in, to maintain ecological integrity and and when we came to kind of recognizing, well, yes, they're an adjunct to our mandate, but it's also an opportunity for us as as an agency to ensure that 
when they did get uh, expanded and, and proved that the, the, the requirement for for ensuring that that ecological integrity was maintained by through reduced wildlife mortality and and uh, connectivity, then it uh, you know it became an easier sell and and then certainly as people have become aware of these structures and the success that they're having, then of course the public is on board as well and don't seem to be quite uh, uh, cons- concerned about the the added cost because we've we've factored there's probably a 30 to 35 percent overall increase in the cost of a of, of four laning a, a section of highway by including all of these wildlife crossing structures and and fencing and whatnot but certainly from you know the the, the ensuring the the wildlife is uh, is still within the park for for viewing as well as being able to 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 safely motor through the the park at uh, it has certainly brought about the, I think, the advocacy and and uh, support that that governments need to, you know, whether you want to call it social license or whatnot, to to actually undertake some of this expansion while still uh, building in all of these things. So that, you know, when we talk about from a from a Parks Canada perspective, we always talk about we've got three objectives and we don't weight them any as one being more important than the other. They're all equally important, but you know. Safety of the motoring public, improved uh, uh, transportation and goods movement through the park by putting in things like remote avalanche control systems and whatnot to ensure that the, the highways stay open as long as possible through through winter and summer. As and then thirdly is to maintain the you know the the reduce the wildlife mortality and uh, and conductivity. And as I say, all three are are kind of three legs in a stool. You can't do one or two of them and, and not do the third. Mm-hmm. Well, and, you know, it, it's interesting talking about that um, in terms of keeping the highways open. In Here in Hamilton, the uh, Highway 403, uh, there is a mudslide and part of a retaining wall gave way. Uh, as you know, we're right along the escarpment. Mm-hmm. And um, the I think it was two lanes of a six-lane highway got shut down for about three days. And everything just grinded to a halt because uh, it's the primary right. way in and out of the city. It's if you want to get to the U.S. from here, it's like one of the fastest ways. Like it was, it was ridiculous how mm-hmm. how much of a significant impact that had from a very natural event. So I and that's that's you know in Hamilton in the city um, where you can access any kind of resource from construction through planning uh, immediately. So I would imagine that you know having a similar incident happening somewhere in Banff National Park would, would be even more significant uh, because you can't just sort of have everyone there and ready to work. Um, exactly. And, and there's, you know, and, and there's always, you know, in, in urban centers and whatnot, alternate routes that, that, well, they're, they're not designed to take the kinds of volumes at least allows people to kind of detour around uh, certainly the trans Canada highway, that there's not a lot of alternative uh, routes that are close by. And so once, Especially as we get further into uh, into BC and beyond uh, Banff and Yoho, we then start to see, and you know, Parks Canada again uh, sees uh, the, the Trans Canada Highway going through Glacier and Mount Revelstoke National Park through the Rogers Pass, where there's, uh, I think, at last count, if my memory serves me correctly, about 144 avalanche paths that come across that highway and and uh, as well cross the railroad line through the CP, and so. That's a major, you know, consideration for us as every year in terms of monitoring and managing the avalanche control with the help of the the Canadian Army in terms of the Howitzer program. To but uh, avalanches and and whatnot are 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 elements that that do uh, at times come across uh, uh, unnatural or unexpected releases that then close the highway and so these are all elements that we take into account as we start to and so some of the stuff we're doing in Yoho we, we go across an avalanche pass there at Mount Bosworth and so we're putting in these remote avalanche control systems because right now the avalanche control is is done by heli bombing but heli bombing you can only fly when the cloud cover is is high enough and so in the middle of a storm and things are starting to go to to hell in a handbasket then you're you're forced to from just an overall risk and safety perspective to the motoring public have to close the highway 
which has then major impacts if it's several days, especially if you start thinking about guys that are hauling vegetables and whatnot and, and all perishables that uh, only have so much uh, fuel and or they're carrying cattle or, or hogs or whatnot, and all those animals have to be watered and fed somewhere along the way if they're, they're delayed from getting to, to market by a couple of days. So it, it has tremendous impacts, and so we're looking at these at remote avalanche control systems where we can detonate explosives uh, higher up on the mountain uh, without having to, to fly, in which case then we can control the, the buildup of snow and, and, of course, these avalanche paths tend to come across the highway and at the bottom right now, as we've been talking, we'll be putting in wildlife fences and whatnot. And so the last thing we want is is these avalanches taking on all this fencing every every year that then has to be replaced. And so the notion is to, to proactively get up there and do these uh, remote uh, explosives so that, in fact, uh, we can... Uh, reduce the, the amount of slide material that comes down at any one time so it doesn't take out the fence but yeah it's it seems like all of this is just a ploy for you to get to blow stuff up <laughs> i'm going to be honest well there's, there's always a bit of attractiveness to that but at any rate uh, it's uh, <laughs> but it, it, it's constantly a challenge and so but I, and i guess that's one of the you know i'll leave with a, a final thought is just just that you know we've we've got 30 35 years of experience now uh, working on uh, building the, the, this highway, and we and we learn every time we build something, we we learn something new. The wildlife teaches us something, and and so it's a constant uh, adaption and mit- by mitigation, you know. So we we mitigate, and then we 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 study, and then we we subsequently make some other, more modifications. Always time trying to improve, and and luckily, you know, because we've had this long history, we're now looked upon by many in the world to, as a source of uh, ideas and information so that uh, they don't repeat some of our, our mistakes and they, they learn and we learn from them. Yeah, well, I've got two two final questions for you that okay. both should be relatively quick. Um, the first, it, it, it's the double arch in uh, Banff, right. is an aesthetically beautiful bridge. It really is. Um, and I kind of get this image in my head of the engineers and the biologists going through a uh, West Side story back and forth over the planning table um, because it's there's a, it looks like there's an expansion of meadow over top of a classic bridge design. Um, what is the the planning look like in order to sort of bring that into it? Um, is it just sort of replicating what's around or is this just sort of a happy accident that you, you needed to put a a bridge there and it happened to come across as a very aesthetically pleasing look with the right kind of plant life on it? Well, I think, you know, it's, it's a bit of a combination. (laughs) You know, you can't, uh, you know, you have all of this, this, uh, spectacular scenery around you and so you need to you know certainly from a parks canada perspective and an aesthetics perspective we've always talked about when we build the highway we want it to 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 uh, set lightly on the land and to to be reflective of the of the terrain it's going through as opposed to to simply carving our way through and and uh, upsetting the the overall view viewscape and landscape but certainly you know we knew we had to put some soil across that particular structure. And then it became this question of how important was uh, plant life on this. And so, you know, you start to say, okay, well, you know, we, meadows, we've got lots of those. And so do we need a full complement of, of, uh, of uh, vegetation on top of the, the structures? And again, without a lot of experience on this, we, we, we tended to err on the side of, uh, of caution. And so we planted them fairly heavily on the assumption that, you know, sticking them up on the structure where you've got the potential for frost coming up through the, on the underside of the, in the winter time and killing off the roots of some of these plants, we, we selected where we should plant these started off with relatively small plants that uh, had an opportunity to uh, to to establish their roots and to grow selected uh, vegetation that was in fact you know native vegetation we certainly uh, from a park canada perspective one of our mandate is not to introduce non-indigenous species into the into the park and so we we actually selected and transplanted material from along the right of way uh 
small shrubs then and and trees and actually planted them up there so that they'd have a greater success because they were kind of hardened off and and understood and so but we also planted heavily on the assumption that 50 percent die-off would happen well lo and behold i think there's been about 95 percent take so we only had about five percent die off and so we've got and 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 then so over time mother nature being what mother nature is is that we've had it it's self itself starting to uh uh seed and 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 other species grow along there and to the point where you know we're now talking about after 30 some odd years that these structures have been in place now having to start to think about should we go in there in fact uh do some uh, clearing and uh, selective clearing so that th- th- there's a better uh, movement to corridors through there so it's not quite so because some animals like that that open space to be able to see where others like that uh, dense cover and of course the smaller animals also are looking for you know the covers so they you need to also consider you know when we put in some dead dead shrubs and stumps and and uh, and rocks so that uh, the smaller animals have places to to hide and to, to for cover as they they move across the structure. So certainly the first two are much more iconic. The 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 last four that you know, people driving through and and if they notice you'll see a, a little bit less vegetation on top of them. It's not as a result of you know not enough money. It was just as, as I say adaptive management as we've learned is that. Over time, we probably don't need to plant them quite as heavily. That wildlife seems to to be less uh, uh, requirements of that uh, that kind of urban park setting, as and uh, and are are quite happy to 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 travel through those those crossing structures with with less vegetation on them. And then, of course, the other part was is more architectural. Is uh, we the, the, we started off with uh, you know cast in place. Uh, uh, head walls uh, with uh, lots of rock up against them, and as as time has gone on, we've they've, we've diminished that a little bit, but always with the notion of we can become, but you know, utilitarian, and they could uh, could have been just blank concrete uh, head walls, but uh, chose to use the rock and integrate them because you know, from my perspective and the philosophy is that these parks are going to be here for a long time after i'm i'm gone and uh, and sort of reflects back to some of the thinking that uh, in the early 30s and whatnot when the federal uh, government was building post office and that uh, there and train stations these are often the you know still being maintained and are, are the architectural gems here and so for the sake of a few dollars and and some rock that at least we can make these things uh, become the iconic uh, uh, postcard uh, structures that we're seeing today absolutely and to wrap up and i think it's also a great way to wrap up this this little mini series on uh, the parks canada um a wildlife corridor system uh you've been involved in this project for 30 some odd years i understand um and over that time there is an almost immeasurable number of animals and people who are happily going about their business because of this program from the the little you know mice and chipmunks trying to run across the road to the the large collisions with uh, carnivores or unglets that result in death on both sides uh, to the millions of dollars in you know economic loss in addition to that so sort of looking back at all of that and, and keeping in mind there are literally hundreds of thousands of living beings because of this project, how do you feel about all of it? How do you look back at it? Well, certainly with a, a great deal of pride, and uh, but uh, recognizing too that you know uh, uh, to do it in one little isolated location is great, and you can take a, a lot of souls from that and, and pride. But you know, really, where I've been kind of focusing now that I've been retired and I've come back to to help Parks Canada on on the section uh, through Yoho, but. In my retirement, I've really been trying to, to expose the, this notion of and, and kind of share some of this information and learnings that that have acquired over this 30 some odd years so that we start to see uh, greater adoption of these uh, these crossing measures and uh, in, in special places uh, around the, the country, especially here in, in North America, because uh, uh, certainly, uh, you know, 
there's, there's lots of areas for improvement uh, from a wildlife uh, mortality perspective on on a number of our highways here in Canada as well as down in the the, the western U.S. states. And so certainly, you know, so it's a bit of a, a, a teaching and the ability to, to go out there and, and perhaps advocate for, for, for a few more of these along our highways. To find out more about the work being done with wildlife corridors by Parks Canada, visit pc.gc.ca. That's the show for this week, folks. I want to thank Terry for sharing his time with us and remind all of you that part one of this series, which focused on the ongoing research of wildlife using the corridors, is available at thefurbears.com or on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, and iHeartRadio. Until next time, this is Michael Howie for Defender Radio, reminding you to stay informed and stay strong.